Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Nice to see you again. I thought in today's video we could talk a little bit about discus. So this might be a video more aimed towards the newbie. It's some things that you might want to know before you dive in and get involved with these fantastic fish. The discus fish, uh, they're a cichlid. They're one of my favourite fishes, the, the ones that really got me into the hobby. So I thought I'd share some tips, some things that I've learned over the years of keeping them. Uh, and even if you're an experienced keeper, maybe you can let us have some tips of your own down in the comments. So as I say, these are my favourite fish. This is what really got me into the hobby. The discus, it's a cichlid, it's a South American fish. They originate from the Amazon uh, and its various tributaries. Um, what you generally find is they're classified as either wild fish or domestic fish. Everything you can see here, these are all domestic fish. And all that means is that they are wild strains that have been crossbred and interbred um, to get these fantastic colours and patterns that you see here. Um, so these are hand raised or manually raised rather than wild fish. Um, they are still quite big fish so the first thing you probably need to think about is what kind of tank you're going to house them in. So everything that I tell you here is just going to be my opinion. It's what I think works best from my years of experience. It's not necessarily the only way to do something. There's no rights and wrongs. I'm not one of these people that will lay down the law and say if you don't do it my way you're doing it the wrong way but this is going to give you a good start at least. So like I say they are pretty big fish. They, it's not unusual to get six, seven, eight inches or more um, when they get to full size. Um, so you need a fairly large aquarium by most people's standards. They're not going to fit in a little two foot tank. It's, that's, it's just not going to happen for you. So what you want is something around the size of maybe 180 litres, um, 40 gallons if you're American, something around that size that's good to get started with. Because as well as being big fish, they're also social fish. So they want to be kept in groups. They want to be kept together. You don't want to keep three, you don't want to keep four. Um, I'd go for a minimum of six. So that 180 litre tank, that's going to get you comfortably six. Let them grow into adulthood. Maybe even squeeze in a few um, companion fish uh, at the same time. I don't particularly think the shape of the tank really matters. Um, I prefer a longer tank rather than a taller tank because I think it gives them more swimming room. Um, if, as you see from the video, they don't really stick to the top or the bottom or the middle. They're, it's their tank. They're all over it. Um, they're quite feisty fish. I mean, a lot of the time you'll see videos of discus that just looks like they're big discs floating in air, not really doing much. But as you can see here, they're always having a little pop at one another. So they need a bit of swimming space. They need some space to get away from each other. So even if you don't want a lot of decoration, it's good to have something in there just to break up the sight lines. Uh, the tanks that you'll see popular is what they call bare bottom tanks. That means no decoration, no substrate. Uh, and then that it really just makes it easier to clean up after the fish if you keep them like that. So if that's your thing, absolutely fine. Uh, if not, and you prefer a planted tank, then yeah, go for it. It is a little bit harder to keep clean and you will have to do a little bit more maintenance to make sure you get in all the nooks and crannies because the main thing discus require is pristine water. They really appreciate some nice clean water. So if you're not getting in there cleaning up regularly, there's a higher chance of you running into issues. The tank itself, you're going to want to keep fairly hot because discus appreciate higher temperatures. Um, I think the ideal range is kind of 28 to 30 degrees Celsius. Um, they can go a little bit more or go a little bit less, but then you're starting to make compromises at that point, but that's, that's up to you. Um, but what you do have to bear in mind is if you are running your tank hot, that kind of limits what you can do in terms of plants or other tank inhabitants, because you need to pick things that are compatible. Um, so in this tank, for instance, you'll see a lot of the smaller fish, they are cardinal tetras. Uh, I chose cardinals because in my experience neon tetras are just that little bit smaller and they end up being seen as a bit of a snack. I know I'll keep saying this but discus are cichlids so if they think something will fit in their mouth they're going to have a go at it and they will try and eat it. Um, to my very expensive experience that will happen. So I've got, there's a few tetras that are, are good options so whether it's cardinals, rummy nose tetra, great schooling fish, they look really good in a big school. Um, Congo tetras, lemon tetras, Colombian tetras, all kinds of things. Um, I do have a few rainbow fish in here. Um, that was more out of necessity than particularly picking those fish, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend them, but they are working quite well. Uh, I have some bristlenose placostomus or incestrous. I have some sterby corridoras hiding away in the rocks. 
Um, th there are lots of compatible tank mates out there, so you just need to do a bit of research and make sure you're not picking something that's going to be really unhappy in those warmer temperatures. Plants-wise, we're looking at things like uh, Anubius, uh, some of the crypt species, some of the Amazon swords uh, species. Uh, but you do have to watch out because the heat will be a problem to some plants. If you do plan on going for the bare bottom look, sometimes it's a good idea to put some plants in pots. Um, because then at least you can still get the benefit of both worlds there. You get an easy to clean up tank and you get some nice greenery in there and split up some of the sight lines and make the fish a bit better and a bit happier that way. Um, if you want to check out some videos I've made on that subject before, it's, it's quite easy. You just fill up a little terracotta plant pot with gravel, stick in your chosen plant and away you go really. Then you can move it around and you can change things up fairly easily. You don't have to worry about uprooting anything. So your next concern is probably um, filtration. So this particular tank, I run it on a freshwater sump. Um, sump. If you can get a space for a sump, I think that's always the best way to go because it gives you so many benefits. Um, it lets you hide away your heaters and some of your equipment in there. So for instance, I have my heaters, my CO2 equipment, pump, air pumps, air stones, uh, loads and loads of biological media in there. It just gives you so much options. But canister filters, they're also really good. Um, you just want a lot of filtration, whatever type you go for. So I have seen people run very successful tanks just with sponge filters, and that's absolutely fine. Um, it, it's really about what effort you want to put in, because the filtration that you put in um, also is matched by what work you're going to do. So if you are just using sponge filters, you're going to have to do a lot more gravel vacuuming and things like that. Um, but in terms of filtration, more is always better. Now you don't want something that's going to pin the fish to the side of the tank because the flow is so strong, but you do want to be aiming for a good high turnover rate of the water. And you do want to get a lot of biological filtration in there because these are big fish. They're big fish, they're messy fish. You want to be feeding them a lot, especially if they're young, um, because that, that helps and aids their growth. So when you're feeding a lot, they're also pooping a lot, but there's also going to be a lot of waste from leftover food as well. So um, anything up to kind of 10 times the water volume per hour, you can turn that over, that's probably going to be a, a great thing to aim for. As well as keeping the water clean with filtration, you really need to be keeping the water clean with water changes. Um, I know if you... I've ever been on the internet or any of these fish groups, you'll know that everyone is always banging on about water changes. It's not something you can skip with discus. You do really need to do it. They benefit from clean water so much, and I've, I've tried and tested this myself by shutting down my water changes or lowering the amount that I do, and, and it just doesn't work. The fish start to go downhill quite fast. Um, the best you can hope for if you don't want to do water changes is that they don't grow very quickly, um, but it can have a lot of serious detrimental effects. Now, that's not to say that you have to start immediately doing 90% water changes every single day. And if you join some of the discus specific forums, you will find people who do that. I'm not saying you need to do that, but um, for instance, on this tank here, I try and do two water changes a week uh, of 50%, which a lot of people will start to suggest that for other fish tanks, only if you have a problem, but that's kind of the standard or the norm with um, uh, discus aquariums. You might not need to do that. You might get away with 10% changes every other day. You might get away with a 20% change once a week. Uh, I find it works best for me if I try and get those two big water changes in once a week. Um, there are various theories behind this. Um, one is that you are, as well as keeping the nitrates low and keeping clean, pristine water, which is going to benefit any fish, um, the, there are there is talk about discus releasing hormones into the water which can affect growth so you might have fish that are ready to start spawning and they will release hormones into the water which some say can stunt the growth of other fish I, I'm not sure whether that's right or not I just know that they do appreciate the bigger changes as well as just cleaning the water you're also replacing some of the, the necessary minerals um, I'm not a subscriber to needing to use RO water to get the best out of your fish. These these all kept in tap water, these fish here. I do use a, what's called an HMA filter, a heavy metal axe, but essentially all that does is remove any of the nasties from the water, which means I can run it straight from the tap straight into the, the tank uh, without using any dechlorinator or chemicals. Um, but other than that, I think straight plain old tap water, if you have to use the dechlorinator, that's fine. But 
you don't need RO. I think you really only need to worry about RO and specific water parameters if you're going to get into breeding. So if you're just getting started out, that's probably not where you're going to go, but it's things to look into later. Often people will discuss ad nauseum the specific water parameters you need to be able to keep discus. Yes, they do like softer water. Um, I find it's best to go with stable parameters rather than try and hit a specific number. So if your pH is 6.5 or 7.5, it doesn't really matter as long as you can keep it there rather than have it fluctuating all the time. Um, again, with the hardness, GH and KH, it doesn't really matter as long as you keep it there. I find they're actually, discus are often talked about as being a really delicate fish, but they're actually a lot hardier than most people will give credit for. So I, I would aim for whatever your water parameters are, stick with them, get good at keeping them consistent and keeping them stable, and then you should be really successful keeping your fish. When it comes to selecting your fish, um, you've got loads of options. In the UK here, certainly, and I do know in the US as well, there are quite a number of really good, high quality, reputable specialists, whether they're breeders or whether they import from a certain number of farms. Um, they, they all advertise readily on Facebook and websites and various other places so you get a good chance to check out the quality of the fish you get to engage with some of the other um, people who have bought from them it does get a bit tribal sometimes so you have to kind of <laughs> wade your way through that but I would recommend going to one of these breeders or specialists rather than going to your local pet shop and picking the ones they've got there now that's not to say that they're bad um, it's just that one of the things I think is really important is to foster that relationship with that specialist because that's someone that wants you to come back and buy more fish when you inevitably upgrade your tank and want to get more of them. Um, so they'll do their best to make sure that you're happy and that you keep your fish happy and that you have a really good experience. You just don't always get that from a pet shop. Uh, and the, the pet shop fish, well, sometimes they are really good quality as well. I know some of these specialists supply pet shops, for instance. Um, it, it's just a bit more hit and miss that way. Um, definitely, if you get a chance, go and physically look at the fish that you're interested in buying. If you can get to a specialist and see all their stock and then hand pick the ones that you want, that's obviously the best way to do it. If you can't do that, sometimes they have uh, regular photos or videos hosted on their websites and webcams and you can sometimes go and pick the specific fish. Um, that's really useful you can do that. When you do that, you're looking for fish that are active, healthy, bright, uh, you want bright eyes, you want high fins, you don't want clamped fins, you don't want hiding fish, you don't want shy fish, you want to pick the ones that are straight up to the glass to see what's going on, begging for food constantly. That's a, a real good tip is to see them eat and make sure that they are eating before you pick them up. Um, they do sometimes stress when travelling, so it can be a bit of a pain to get them to start eating again. So you want to at least know that they were eating before you got them. You'll hear people talking about Asian fish versus German fish and what they usually mean there is the German fish are from the stinker line um, or the stinker family. They are a German fish bred in tap water, um, supposedly very hardy, um, some lovely fish there. Uh, or the Asian ones are the ones from the various farms, whether it's from Vietnam, Malaysia or whatever country they are shipped in, they can be a bit hit and miss, but some of the Asian fish are also absolutely gorgeous, strong as rocks, um, and, and really hardy too. These particular fish that you see here, they're from my local specialist, it's just Corbin Discus, and these are from a breeder called Martin Ng, um, and I'm sure you'll agree they're absolutely fantastic. In terms of diet, as with everything, I think a varied diet is quite important. I will feed a mixture of dried food, frozen food, as well as um, specialist food, shall we call it, of beef heart or fish heart sometimes. Um, I've made some videos on that, go and check out my back catalogue about the various foods, but I think it's good to switch it up. You don't want to get fish, especially these fish, they get, they get set in their ways and sometimes if you're feeding beef heart constantly forever and then you run out and you can't get any more and you want to switch on to a dry food and they just don't take it, you'll run into problems that way. So I feed a, a variety of things. Um, I'll put some links down in the descriptions of some of my favourite food. Um, you can check them out. But things like um, Vitalis discus pellets, 
Vibro Bites by Hikari. Um, they are two good dry foods that I think they do really well with. Um, but there are plenty of other foods. I, I'm always trying them out and some of them they take really readily too. So that's, that's what you want to look out for. In terms of frozen foods, I tend to avoid bloodworms. I don't think there's all that much nutritional value in it for these fish. Um, but frozen brine shrimp, they absolutely love that stuff. So that's definitely worth looking at. So my final bit of advice, you've got your tank, you've got your filtration, you know your water parameters, you know what you want to keep. Join up social media, join some groups, join some specialist groups, but take everything with a pinch of salt. Everyone on the internet is an expert, or they at least claim to be, and it, that's just not possible. So join, listen, learn, but don't be put off by the bullies and the bullshit people that you do meet on the internet. Um, I have my own Facebook group, by all means join that, Aquarium Adventures, check out the links in the description below. Uh, you can ask me any questions you want anytime. In fact, I'm all over social media, check out the, the links, as I say, you can just follow me on Instagram, on Facebook, um, as well as joining this channel as a member. So you can join up here and you get access to some extra special clips and snippets of life of me going on doing water changes, various pictures that I just don't release for anywhere else. Um, but like I say, join the groups and make sure you get involved and there isn't anything like a stupid question. Um, my channel used to be called Discus Newbie because I was a newbie, uh, even though I'd been keeping them for years and years. I'm always learning and there's always new things to learn as well. Um, but I hope this provides some kind of help to you if you are thinking about it. It's a really rewarding fish to keep. I think they're absolutely fantastic. Uh, they can give you some heart attacks at times and they're not the cheapest of fish as well so you know it is a bit of an investment but I think it's totally worth it. So I hope you found some of this interesting and maybe even educational. If you've got your own tips by all means leave them in the comments we'll start a discussion. If you want discussion on these topics then go to Facebook and join my Facebook group Aquarium Adventures. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Um, as well as joining the channel as a member. So check out all the links below and hopefully we'll talk soon. See you later.